Well, thank you, Celeste, and uh, for inviting me to give this talk. I, I must I must say that um, I first encountered Larry when I started as a postdoc with Charles Laird, who's over here, and I'd come from Matt Messelson's lab, and I worked on Drosophila heat shock. But actually, I was most interested in satellite DNA. Now, satellite DNA gets its name from the fact that in cesium chloride Messelson stall gradients, there's a main band, but there's also satellite bands that you see uh, occasionally. And that's because they have a different buoyant density because they're homogeneous and have somewhat different, uh, different buoyant density, different base composition from uh, most DNA that's in the main band. And, uh, and anyway, uh, Matt was aware of the fact that in closely related species, you can have different satellites, different satellite DNAs. And he thought that maybe this is responsible for speciation because you see it between closely related species. And he went so far as to talk Dick Lewinton into uh, believing this. And he went ahead and decided that what he would do is go to fertility clinics, look for uh, look for couples who are infertile and look at their satellite DNA and maybe see, find incipient species, and that was his, his idea. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so I, so, but I thought, it, was, it sounds crazy, but I thought it was a pretty good idea, and uh, so I was interested in somehow getting into satellite DNA. So, so when I came to Charles's lab, he pointed me to the fact that there is this phenomenon called position effect variation. I'd never heard of it before, but it's where genes get juxtaposed to heterochromatin, and then they show, they show silencing. And I realized, oh, I can combine my two interests in, in heat shock response and also heterochromatin, which is where the satellites lie. And of course, the guru of satellites at that time uh, was, was Larry Sandler. And so I would, I would go across the street. I was in the zoology department in Charles' lab, go across the street and uh, interact with uh, Scott and the other uh, fly pushers there. And, but in, in particular, uh, Larry, who would love to talk about this stuff. And I took his, I sat in on his course. And I, uh, so uh, yeah, I, I, I drank the Kool-Aid and, uh, <laughs> And this is the way I, I remember uh, Larry. I don't know if he's uh, making a, a, a point or actually uh, there's a punchline of a joke or, or both probably. But, uh, but anyway, I really, I really got into it. And at one point, uh, my position effect variegation on a heat shock puff project was going really well. And I told Larry and, he's, and he invited me to give a departmental seminar on it. And he, when he introduced me, he went through the whole history of position effect variegation, beginning with Muller in 1932. And everybody who started working in Drosophila genetics wanted to work on position effect variegation because they thought they could solve it, but never could. And what he then said was, so this is like sowing one's wild oats. It's something you got to get out of your system. You do it when you're young, and then you move on and do something useful. And I think Larry had it, had it right there, because uh, try as I could, that position effect project, I don't think it really told me much about position effect variegation. And I, I ended up only getting a job because I cloned fly genes and yeast with Ben Hall. But uh, so actually, he was quite right about that. Uh, <laughs> I didn't really solve position effect variegation at the time, but it did whet my interest in the idea that if you study heterochromatin and satellites and centrovirus, you might be able to find a connection between them. And that leads to the question of what specifies a centromere. Now, this question is even older than position of variegation because you could have asked this question back just looking at these drawings from Walter Fleming, where you see from the inverted V shape of these chromosomes, their evident attachment to the mitotic spindle, and especially these heterochromatic knobs that Fleming drew on here, it was clear that there's one position present on every chromosome that's responsible for pulling the chromosome to the pole. But what is it? So uh, fast forward a century, and Louise Clark and John Tarbot answered the question quite clearly. They took a 1.6 kilobase fragment of DNA, they cloned it in a replicating plasmid, and they showed that it could maintain segregation faithfully through meiosis and mitosis. Then they went on to show that if they look at all 16 E centromeres, they could identify a consensus sequence, actually three, 
that they called CD1, 2, and 3, and later work showed that CD1 is the binding site for the CBF1 general regulatory factor, and I'll, uh, I'll say more about that much later. CD3 is the binding site for the kinetochore specific complex, uh, CBF3 complex, that recruits a centromeric nucleosome over this 80 base pair region that's extraordinarily AT rich, and as Sue Biggins has shown, that you have a centromere here with the centromeric histone, uh, CSC4. We prefer to call them collectively centromere H3 to point out the fact that they're histone H3 variants. Uh, for purposes of this talk, I will call them center of protein A or CEMP A. Now, this gives me the opportunity to... Uh, <laughs> to talk about, about, so what we were interested in, in doing was, was following up on, on Sue's work and actually determining just what is in this, in this 80 base pairs. What is that particle? Nucleosome should be 150 base pairs, but this is much smaller. Now, uh, so, so over the years, we've been focused on this question and I'm just going to give you one bit of evidence that uh, we think uh, explains what's actually in here. And it gives me the opportunity to tell you about a, a method that I'll be referring to later, which we call cut and run. It goes like this. We mix live cells with lectin coated magnetic beads. They stick. We permeabilize an antibody. The antibody diffuses in to find its target, say a transcription factor. We then add a fusion between protein A and micrococcal nuclease, eminase which will bind, the protein A will bind to the IgG of the antibody, anchor the MNase. We add calcium to activate the enzyme. And when it cleaves on both sides, the, the factor can come out. We extract the DNA, do paradigm sequencing. It's one day from live cells to purified DNA, and the backgrounds are extraordinarily low, such that, uh, we, such that we and a lot of other people just use this instead of chromatin immunoprecipitation. Now. We're using the supernatant here. However, the yeast centromere is extraordinarily unstable, and that's because it's like a 10 megadalton complex that's bound to one site in the genome and, and renders it completely, completely insoluble. But it turns out that we can use cut and run in order to, to, to look at this. So we, we split the sample, we extract the total DNA and the soluble DNA, and the difference is the insoluble DNA. So now when we apply this to the yeast, to yeast centromere, CSC4, what we see is over two order of magnitude range of digestion, the insoluble fraction is loaded with CSC4 and is directly 80 base pairs right over CD2 where it should be. We also did this with histone H2A, and we see the same thing despite the fact that there's H2A in every nucleosome on the entire chromosome, almost. Uh, the centromere is the centromeric histone, the centromeric nucleosome, is the most insoluble site on the chromosome. So it's been controversial as to whether the centromeric, the centromeric nucleosome in budding yeast has H2A, H2B dimers, but you can uh, judge for yourself. Now, uh, as Ginger pointed out, the point, this is a point centromere, but there are many other types of centromeres. So for example, fission yeast has a regional centromere that at first we thought has no distinguishing features and, and, and has SAMP A. And then in the most homogeneous region of, for most plants and animals, including humans, you basically have this, this satellite that I referred to earlier that was mo we were most intrigued by. However, it's not the only type. When Florian Steiner was a postdoc in the lab, he showed that actually C. elegans, which is holocentric, has these points, looks like point centromeres uh, throughout, so they're actually polycentric. And most strikingly, when Anna Drinnenberg was a, was a postdoc with Harmeet Malik and myself, uh, she showed that actually holocentric insects, including butterflies, for example, are, uh, do not have the same machinery. They don't have centromere protein A or anything that we're accustomed to finding at centromeres. Then there are these curious neocentromeres, these human neocentromeres. So what you're looking at are chromosomes that, from an individual, in which we're marking the centromere and the satellite, alpha satellite here, 
with centromere protein B that I have a lot more to say about later. And what you can see is that the three, three chromosomes at the primary constriction, you have, semp, you have SEMP A. However, in this chromosome, chromosome 4, there's been a shift from its normal position in alpha satellite to a new position more medially because, with SEMP A there, because SEMP A always goes with the active centromere. Now, the individual from whom these chromosomes came was actually phenotypically normal. In fact, this chromosome has undergone at least three human meiotic generations, so it's a normal centromere. And these kinds of observations have led to the idea that centromeres are epigenetic because there's no alpha satellite there, so what could se sequence shouldn't matter. But there's a real problem when, when you think about it with centromeres being just epigenetic and sequence doesn't matter. And this gives me uh, the opportunity to get to some background to what I'm going to tell you next. And that is this term meiotic drive that was introduced uh, by Larry in 1957. And in this paper, they talk about segregation distortion as, a, as an example of meiotic drive. They didn't know at the time that actually my, meiosis is normal uh, in this case. However, there's one example that they have here in which, which is really meiotic drive, and this comes from Marcus Rhodes, what he called preferential segregation. Now, Rhodes was studying, was studying knobs in, in corn, and these knobs in corn were, are distal heterochromatic elements that become, have unusual behavior in the presence of a particular knob called abnormal knob 10. It goes like this. If there's an odd number of recombinations between the centromere and the knob, what happens is that the knob will actually lead at anaphase one and will end up in a gamete, and the gamete's in a preferred position to make it to the next generation. Okay, now, when Harmit was a postdoc in the lab, he discovered that, that Sempe in Drosophila was undergoing adaptive evolution and, and we realized that this kind of implied that there's an arms race going on, but how can you have an arms race for something as, as essential as the basic centromere protein, which is essential for every cell division? Because in an arms race, there are going to be winners and losers, and the losers are just going to, uh, will basically be unfit, and the same goes for male meiosis. However, what Rhodes was describing, uh, this kind of process actually would work in the sense that, that, that if there is if centromeres can play the same game, then what will happen is that it will end up in the preferred position, and this is true for both plants and animals. And so this led to the idea that, that what's going on is that the satellites are actually expanding in female meiosis. They're, they're basically expanding, and in female meiosis, they will get more SEMP A, so they will have more microtubule contacts, and therefore they might be able to, to or reorient themselves so they would go to the favored pole. It's self, a completely selfish process. However, we also knew that from work, uh, from work showing that, that if, you have, if you have an unbalanced segregation uh, from Bruce McKee, if there's an unbalanced segregation, it could abort male meiosis, so it aborts for managenesis. So, so if this came, same thing happened in the male, it would be deleterious, but that, that allowed us to uh, explain what could happen. So, so it's driving in female meiosis, but it's sterilizing males would be deleterious. However, it goes far enough that it can encounter a mutation in centromere protein such as SEMP A if it mutates such that it restores, it restores the, the balance <clears throat> uh, parity between the two, then, then both the centromere and the mutant will drive the fixation together. And so this basically can explain what we refer to as the centromere paradox. That is, you have this rapidly evolving DNA, the thing that Matt Messelson first uh, got excited about. In fact, uh, we, had, we had actually pointed out that, that centromere drive is occurring in Robertsonian translocations, which are fusions between two acrocentrics uh, which happens quite frequently, and it was already known that that has an advantage over its, over its acrocentric pairing partners 
Uh, and Art Daniel then pointed out that actually consistent with this, with our, our proposal, that actually uh, that there is a loss in fertility in, ma in male fertility. So, so, uh, so <laughs> this crazy idea. I, I, get, I talked about this story uh, last year at at Matt Messelson's 88th birthday symposium, where the students basically got together, and I uh, so I told this story there. And Matt said, oh, yeah, yeah, well, we never actually followed up and went to the fertility clinics. So we never actually got funded for it. But, uh, but anyway, but he had the right idea. Actually, a lot of support for this model has come, uh, for example, in mice from Mike Lampson and Ben Black, where they showed that the predictions hold for, fe uh, predictions hold, uh, for in female meiosis, that there's expanded satellite repeats, that they get extra SEMP A, and they make it to the asymmetric spindle. And so, so, so drive is, is pretty well accepted. But it doesn't stop there. Uh, Jin Chen has introduced the term mitotic drive. So we're talking, we're basically talking about much later events in meiosis, but actually the very first stem cell division, there's extra SEMP A that drives. Uh, this, is, uh, this is in both the male germline and the, and the female germline. And so what, what's happening is that all the centromeres are basically going to the stem cell and the, others, and the, the, the other centromere is going to, to the, the uh, progenitor cell, okay? Now, why would it do this? Well, this was also explained by, by Jin uh, in showing that there's unidirectional fork movement on all the chromosomes such that all the old histones go to the stem cell and the new histones go to the, go to the progenitor cell because the old histones go with the leading strand and the new histones to the lagging strand. So here we have a situation where, where a selfish process has been co-opted by the host in order to do something very fundamental for its biology. Now, developmental biologists tend to think of development as they tell us that it's very complicated. But actually, if you think about it, what this means is that the very first step in stem, in stem cell division, the very first step in a, develop, in, a, in a differentiation lineage is actually one that is simple chromosome mechanics. And I think it's quite interesting, and Larry would have liked this, that, that actually this is all discovered as chromosome mechanics uh, in, in Drosophila. It's nice to see that Joe Gall finally has found an interesting model organism. <laughs> okay, but the point I want to make here is that centromere, that drive, centromere drive means that centromeres are defined by sequence. And so what is it about sequence that is so important? So we, uh, we start on a new model organism, human, and. Uh, this is work of Jitendra Thacker in the lab, uh, and we did chip uh, for SEMP A. We isolated satellites. We clustered similar sequences or rank ordered based on size, and then we found the most abundant clusters. And this told us that human centromeres are dominated by two dimeric <coughs> units, uh, one that is found in cent centromere one and several others, uh, of 340 base pair dimers and one cent 13 of 342 base pairs. Now, this was nothing new. Actually, Ivan Alexandrov had, had shown this uh, way back, uh, and he had shown it just by cutting out bands from uh, after cutting with eco, eco R1 and had worked all this out. So there's super chromosomal family one, two, and three. And what all three of these have in common is something called a SEMP-B box. So what is SEMP-B? Which I showed you actually cytologically basically labels all <coughs> human uh, alpha satellites. So it's highly conserved in vertebrates. It binds to the SEMP-B box and it bends DNA 60 degrees. So hold that thought. It's not essential. It's required for human artificial chromosome formations. It's found in all human centromeres except for the Y. So, uh, so what we decided to do was, uh, was to apply cut and run to SEMP A and SEMP B and see if they're in the same particle, and indeed they are. So, so this shows an example from Centromere 7, an array that is very well studied, 
and you're looking at a sample of the array. And what is kind of remarkable about this is both SEMP A and SEMP B are showing, are showing occupancy that differs depending on the particular repeat, even though they're so similar. So let's break this in half. And now you can see that there's a big particle here in between two uh, largest particles, that, but then break it in half again. And now what you can see is that you've got the SEMP B box. And if you look at each of the different, each of the four units that we're looking at here, they're all different. However, what they have in common is on one side or the other of the SEMP B box, you basically see a discontinuity. It suggests that maybe SEMP B is doing something to induce something or do something to cause this large complex to form. And what might that be? Well, a clue, uh, a, oh, and then I'll just point out that this also says that even though these sequences are really very similar, sequence does matter in a very intricate, exquisite way, but which, which sort of makes us wonder, well, what, what could it possibly be going on here? So the clue for us came from uh, talking with, with Bill Earnshaw at a meeting, and uh, he, he was wondering, uh, he had he had come up with what he called the Sempe paradox. And the Sempe paradox was that African green monkeys have a lot of alpha satellite, but he couldn't find any centromere protein B there. And he asked us, why don't you take a look and see if you can you know, do, do some genomics and see if you can see anything there. So Siva Kassanathan, uh, when he was a graduate student in the lab, uh, decided to take on this challenge. And so if you look at alpha satellite, in great apes and old world monkeys, you find that actually Bill was quite right about that. It was controversial back 20 years ago, but it's pretty clear that only the great apes have sent bee boxes, not the old world monkeys. So then Siva did something interesting. He asked about foldbacks. So what he did was he ran RNA fold program and he found a striking difference. Humans have short foldbacks, whereas monkeys have long foldbacks. And on an energy scale, this has high delta G, this has low delta G. And if you ask about the Y chromosome, which lacks a SEMP B box, it actually is similar to monkeys. It has strong foldbacks. And then it turns out that neocentromeres also have high predicted dyad symmetry, human neocentromeres. And not just from this one, uh, this foldback, but also using another algorithm for stress induced structural transitions, what we see is that. Neocentromeres are sort of are very high with respect to the their DNA melting, their predicted DNA melting behavior as well as cruciform extension. And then chicken neocentromeres, which are quite common, turn out to be off the chart. So we have a commonality of these foldbacks. Okay, what about mice? Mice have two satellites. They have a major satellite, so it's about 10% of the genome, and then there's a minor satellite where the functional centromere is. And they also follow this rule because the minor satellite has SEMP B and it has weak foldback potential, whereas the major satellite has no SEMP B boxes and it has, it's more stable. In fact, if we look throughout the eukaryotic kingdom, we see this divergence. So for example, corn has more stable predicted secondary structure, whereas Arabidopsis is less stable. Now you'll see that even fish and yeast this holds for, but not only fish and yeast, but budding yeast, the same thing. You see that centromeres, the centromeric sequences are enriched for these, fold, for these predicted, high predicted foldback structures. Now in the case of budding yeast, we have different species. So we have species that are strictly defined as being Saccharomyces, and then we have others that are loosely defined. And it turns out that CDE1 that I told you about before has a different protein there. It's not CBF1, but rather we see the motif that's unmistakable because it's the one for REB1. And what we see is that there's lower foldback. So this is CDE1, and right next to it is this 80 base pair region. And what we find is that it has low potential for foldback in these species here. So what's interesting about this is REB1 bends DNA 60 degrees, exactly as I pointed out for SEMP B. So throughout the eukaryotic kingdom, there are two types of centromeres. There are those with a DNA bending factor, and there are those without but predict strong cruciform.
cruciform structures. Okay, all this is hypothetical theory. Is there any, is there any evidence that this is actually the case? Experimental evidence. So SIVA looked at data that came from Dave Levin's group where they had used permanganate dependent nuclease foot printing. So what that is, is potassium permanganate will derivatize single strand DNA and so it won't fold, it won't re-anneal on itself, so therefore, so therefore it can be chewed up by S1 nuclease, and then it's a matter of just sequencing the ends, and you can deduce therefore where the where the the, the where the non-B DNA was, or you might think of as just the single-stranded regions in the genome. And it turned out that half of their signal was over alpha satellite in human B cells and also over major and minor in mouse. Now, SIVA also looked at, at their data for resting B cells, and you can see that there's a big difference. In resting B cells, you don't, you don't really see this. So what this implies is that when you're resting B cell, you don't need a centromere. However, you can induce, when you induce proliferation, when you activate the B cells, then maybe these, these potential cruciforms would basically, would basically pop out and it would be picked up by this, uh, by this assay. Okay, so this leads to the following speculative model. What we imagine is that there are two types of centromeres. There are those that can form these cruciforms spontaneously, and then there are those that require a DNA bending factor in order to be induced. We don't know how that might happen. It might be torsional or whatever, but basically you end up with a cruciform structure. What's interesting about a cruciform structure for centromere biologists is that the dedicated chaperone for putting in SEMP A is called h -GERP. It, cut, it, it gets its name from the fact that it was first described as holiday junction recognizing protein because it recognizes a four-way junction. And these four-way junctions by this model will be created all the time at centromeres and therefore it's, it would just drop its payload in order to put in the, the SEMP A. So that would mean that centromere specification is really these fallback structures and since, since the delta G's can vary quite a bit, we have actually exquisite differences you can imagine between the stability of centromeres. But, uh, but I put in a slide for, uh, for Ginger. <coughs> oh, I, I left it out. But anyway, <laughs> I thought I put it in. Okay, sorry about that, Ginger. But there's, there's another model. I think I have it here, yeah. So another possibility fitting with what Ginger was talking about is that, is that there's, there's centromeric RNA that is actually, so what's happening is Reb1 we know can open up chromatin basically, open up uh, evict nucleosomes, et cetera, so it makes a hole for, for, uh, for, for, DNA, for RNA for transcription to occur. Uh, so this is uh, yet another model, and these are not mutually exclusive. We actually suspect that both are going on. Okay, so the work I described was that of, of Siva, Cass, and Nathan, and, and G2 Thacker, and I'll stop there, and I don't know if we have time for questions. Sure. Sure. Okay.